Wander Wealthy Podcast, episode 201 with Carly Tizano. Hello, hello. Welcome back to another episode of the Wander Wealthy Podcast. My name is Tess Wicks. I am the host of this show, founder of Wander Wealthy, and business coach to all the money, wealth, financial, money mindset coaches of the world. Welcome, everyone. Guess what? It's not just me today. I am joined by a very special guest. Her name is Carly Tizano. She has been a longtime listener of the Wander Wealthy podcast. She actually told me that she's listened to every episode, which just brings me straight to tears. And she is going to be sharing some really, really good things with you today because, hey, Happy New Year. We have just rolled in found ourselves, maybe more like stumbled in, to 2021. Finally, 2020 was definitely a long one. But that's not to say that whatever we were dealing with in 2020 hasn't rolled into 2021 with us. And Carly is a certified life coach from the Life Coach School, and she's also a New Year's resolution coach. She works with her clients to develop the skills and confidence to set goals that they can and will achieve, not just for one year, but every year. And it's such a blessing to have Carly on the show today one week in to the new year to share with us some of her best tips on how to set New Year's resolutions or just top of year goals and ultimately how to stick with them. And I thought it was really helpful for Carly to come on because not only do we as coaches want to set our own goals, we probably have some big business goals that we would like to see through to the end of this year, but we also work with our clients and so often people especially our clients, have money goals, right? Or they might have a New Year's resolution that is somehow tied to money. And so I thought it would be really great to have Carly come in and share some of her expertise around why we set goals around the new year, why so many of us fail to commit and stick with our New Year's resolutions, how we can best support not only ourselves in our journey towards our goal, but also our clients in their own journey, not only while they set their goals and how to support them in making a plan of action and all of that good stuff, but also how to support them as well as how to support ourselves emotionally when we may not always stick to the plan, right? When we may metaphorically fall off the wagon, if you will. So Carly has some unique and really amazing perspectives around this, around how we as coaches can really work and coach ourselves through this process, as well as how to best show up and support your clients. So this is going to be a jam-packed episode. We also ended up talking about some really cool things around flow and motivation and courage and inspiration. So stay tuned for that. And without further ado, let's just dive into this episode number 201 with Carly Tizano. Carly, welcome to the Wander Wealthy Podcast. I am super excited to have you on the show today because we have kind of a long interweaving history together. You've been a longtime listener, and now we get to talk all about your expertise and your business. Um, so we're going to dive into all of that. But first and foremost, welcome. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me here. It's so fun to be on this podcast. I've listened to every single episode. I've been a longtime fan and I love following your journey. So I'm super excited to come here and share with your audience today. Thank you. Yes, we've chatted on and off for the over the past years. I think mostly on Instagram. We've done some interviews just like off the recording. Um, but it's so good to be able to now be here speaking, well, Zoom, Zoom face to Zoom face. Yes. And, and, <laughs> getting a chance for you to share your expertise. So I did a little intro in the beginning before um, we jumped on, but I'd love for you to just kind of take us through your story and really tell us, you know, what you do, who you serve, and ultimately how you got to this point in your journey. Yeah, well, I don't think my journey has been particularly linear yet. Maybe one day as I look back, it will be. Um, I think kind of this part of my life really started when I was in college and I read uh, Gretchen Rubin's book, The Happiness Project. Mm. It's 
a really great story about how she, over the course of a year, changed different things in her life to see what, what would bring her greater happiness, just kind of these little tweaks that she made. And it kind of opened my mind up more into the world of personal development and that we really can change our lives, even in just very small ways. And I didn't kind of realize then how much that would play into my life now. But from there, um, as I was in college, I came across the field of professional organizing. And I immediately fell in love with that, always being kind of an organized person myself, rainbow closet, rainbow bookshelf. And I knew that's what I had to do. So I graduated as fast as I could and I started that business. And as I was running that business and helping clients, I realized how much of what I was doing in working with clients was helping them in the bigger issues of their lives. And my real passion wasn't necessarily helping them go through their kitchen cabinets and their pantry. It was helping them make time and space for the things that really mattered to them. And I realized that in the long term, after I'd leave and they'd have a beautiful pantry, that some of them still were kind of picking up that momentum that they needed to make the big changes and to do the things that really mattered to them. So then I kind of came in and added coaching to my business and I started working with people so that they could start doing those things that they really wanted to, even, even if they have an organized pantry and they found themselves still not doing it, I wanted to be able to help them. And then that kind of continued to spiral out. And so now I'm a New Year's resolution coach and I help women who struggle to keep their New Year's resolutions or who find themselves making the same resolutions every year, um, achieve their goals this year and every year. So I want to keep help them keep their resolutions until December 31st and beyond. And that kind of going back to the happiness project, realizing that I watched her change her life over the course of the year. And so now that's what I work with my clients to help them do in every area of their life, whether it be money or relationships or work, whatever it is they feel like they're struggling with and they, what they really want to revolutionize. That's what I'm there to help them with. Oh, that's amazing. And it's such a beautiful story. And I have always been very impressed by how much you've been able to accomplish, you know, right out of college, going into your organizing business and then, you know, moving through how that has evolved for you personally. And now, you know, you have that and then you also get to, to coach people. And another thing that I think is really cool about what you do and how it really ties back to, you know, the fact that this is a money podcast. It's also a podcast for money coaches, aspiring, new, current, is that so often, like, I find so much overlap between organizing. I've talked to a lot and I've worked with and coached a lot of professional organizers. And there's so much overlap between that and managing your finances that I think, you know, you get such a interesting perspective into how people think and how people, how such tangible external things actually are impacted by how we feel internally. And that's something that I think is important for any coach to kind of bring to the table. Even if you're helping someone organize their closet or manage their budget, there's always something deeper to, to dig into for why they may or usually are not you know, keeping their goal of having their life in order in whatever shape or form you're working them through. Um, so I just wanted to, to share that up front. And I would really love for you to now kind of crack open your story and share a little bit about your money story with us. Since I always like to keep this podcast true to its roots, which was originally a money podcast. I'd love for you to tell us, you know, how you grew up around money, what you learned about money. Maybe this podcast is a big part of your money story as well, but you know, what were, what have your experiences been with money? And now that you're a business owner, you know, how has that maybe changed or how have you had to coach yourself to evolve your, your money story? Yeah, absolutely. It's a great question. Um, I grew up, we always had enough, very kind of upper middle class here in America. And, but I always kind of felt like there was the sense of, we have enough now, but it may not always be that way. Or we, we, we go out to eat, but it, it's still kind of a splurge, kind of that mm -hmm. sense of we have enough, but maybe not really. Um, and as the older sibling, I think kind of hearing my parents talk um, and maybe they, they talk to me about it sometimes too. So I feel like I was kind of always in on I guess what ultimately was their money story. But I have a very vivid memory of being, I was probably five or six and my parents started these three jars. So when I would make money or get an allowance, um, we would put money in the saving jar and the spending jar and the giving jar. And over the course of, I don't remember if it was months or years that kind of fell out of practice. We didn't really do that. And 
I remember one day my parents sent me to grab something out from under their bed and I found those jars kind of like shoved back under the bed behind a bunch of other stuff. They still had money and I'm like, it was kind of whatever. And I realized that that very specifically has shaped the rest of my money story. And it's something that I've had to work on in my personal life and my professional life too, that this idea of we start something and we set up good systems, but then we just kind of push them away and we don't really look at them anymore. We just kind of ignore them. And so I've found that tendency in my own life. I have a lot of great savings systems set up and investing systems set up, but as time goes on, I'm kind of like afraid to look at them. Like I'm trusting that they're working, but I'm just going to pretend that they are and shove them under the bed and ignore them. Um, so even things as simple as like checking my bank account, knowing that I have enough, maybe being afraid that ultimately it won't be enough um, and just not wanting to look at it. So that's something that's kind of shaped my history and your podcast has come in and helped me set up so many of those great money systems, so many um, kind of different savings buckets so that I do know ultimately I have enough for all these different things that I wanted to. Things like being okay with having credit cards. I kind of grew up in a, a culture and a society, kind of like a microcosm of America, I guess, that was very obsessed with Dave Ramsey and never having debt. And so your podcast helped to open my mind to, it is okay to have debt. It's okay to have credit. And in fact, in much of the world, it's actually kind of necessary to have at least some credit history. And so kind of breaking away from how I grew up and being okay with that to really advancing my money story on my own and allowing myself to kind of redefine what I want my money story to be here and going forward. Mm -hmm. And your story has such a great little just touch point on also the organizational aspects of <laughs> like true. shoving <laughs> things under the bed or like away <laughs> and kind of forgetting about them and then rediscovering them later on in life. So I love that. And I think it also goes into where I want, really wanted to take this conversation to really get some, some good tangible tips around, you know, how to set systems up in your life, in your business. I think for a lot of the listeners now, you know, we're running a business and, and a lot of running business is like believing that they're, you know, we have to set all these systems up and then not really knowing how effective they are, but also kind of avoiding them. Right. And like, not being willing to face and, and check and and see, is it working? Is it not working? What's not working about it? How can we te tweak it? And how can we move forward? And I think there is a little bit of like avoidance in there for whatever reason. Um, but so many entrepreneurs and people in general set big goals at the beginning of the year. And I guess my first question is like, why are New Year's resolutions a thing? Like what makes it such a powerful time for us to be setting goals at the top of the year? Do you have some insight on that? Yeah, um, I think it's because in a lot of ways, it's the start of the year. It's a fresh start. We thought 2020 was going to be the start of a new fresh decade. So that kind of made it even more exciting. And now going into 2021, up here at the start of it, people are really excited to leave 2020 behind and to have a fresh start kind of in that way, even though ultimately nothing big is going to has changed on the world as we've ticked over to January 1st. There was no immediate cure coronavirus didn't go away, things aren't immediately better. But mm -hmm. it's still that idea of we have a clean state, slate, a fresh start, kind of on a larger scale, what we have every Monday morning when people are saying, oh, well, I'll start Monday morning. Right. It's just that like on a grander scale times 52, I guess. And I love New Year's resolutions as a container for goals because when you set a New Year's resolution, you do have a whole year to achieve it ultimately is kind of what you're saying when you set it. And so people can set monthly goals or weekly goals or quarterly goals even. But I think, and you can do that even within a New Year's resolution. And a lot of times we do, but I think having that larger picture of in a year, this is where I want to be. This, these are the things I want to have accomplished. And this is the person that I want to be. This is what I want to believe about myself. That gives you such a powerful vision to live into and to work towards. Because when you're honest with yourself, thinking about popping the champagne on December 31st and who you want to be and the things you want to have accomplished is much more powerful than whatever random Thursday night, March 31st is going to be as you come to the end of quarter one. Like that's just not nearly as exciting. And there isn't quite as grand of a picture around that. And I think that's why so many people are compelled with new year's resolutions because of kind of that grand scale, the fresh start and the idea of a whole year is going to have passed. And so I need to be a different person by the end of it. And so ultimately that's why a lot of people want to set them. And also why a lot of people don't follow through, unfortunately. <laughs> Yeah. So let's go into that. I mean, what would you say, 
are some of the biggest reasons why most people don't stick to their new year's resolutions. Like how can we identify our downfall? Well, statistics have shown that about 77% of people have given up on their new year's resolutions after the first week of January. So if, if someone finds themselves giving up, that's okay. They're clearly in the vast majority of people. And a lot of the reasons why we do is merely just because of how our brain is wired. Our brain wants to escape pain and to seek pleasure and to conserve energy. And so by doing that, kind of setting a goal goes against all of those things. Sometimes it's painful. We face failure and rejection. It takes a lot of time and effort and energy. And the process often isn't pleasurable. It's, pleasure it's nice since we get there, but getting there a lot of times isn't. So it makes sense that our brain kind of wants us to, wants to keep us where we are. It's safe and it's comfortable. We know that we're alive where we are and the brain doesn't really know what it's going to take to get where we want to go. And while that's okay, that's what holds a lot of people back. This idea of, well, I've never done it before, or I don't know the exact steps it's going to take to get there, or I just don't have the time, or something new comes up along the way that they didn't expect a new hurdle. Um, or they have a lot of people I found that about June, if they've kept with their resolutions by June, they're kind of like, well, I'd rather focus on this other thing. This is newer or sexier or more exciting because they haven't been working on it. And so they kind of transition then and want to work on something else. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of reasons why at any point during the year, you might be faced with wanting to give up, but that vision that you can create of the person you want to be on December 31st, that's kind of the reason to keep going through all of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you have a process for helping people kind of start to think about their resolutions and plan out how they're going to be able to stick to it. And I think this is perfect because this podcast is getting released, like basically at the failure point yes. <laughs> of when everyone kind of stops their new year's resolution. So whether they need to reset their resolution for the year or they haven't set one yet, you know, what is the process that you rec recommend people to go through as they start to think about what they should be committing to for the next 300 and what would be like, I don't know, 50 nine days nine or eight. Like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, so I walk my clients through, I call it the resolve framework. So it helps you to determine where you are at in the process of achieving the things you want and then where you need to go next. So I always encourage people to start or to go back to, if they didn't start here with the dream phase, which is the first step of the resolve process. And so that's really where you can cast the vision of that future life you want to live. And specifically with New Year's resolutions, that's kind of who you want to be on December 31st and the things you want to have accomplished. Cause we can go to the grander scale of like 25 years, but boiling it down when we're setting new year's resolutions, we really just want to think about that one year, one year from now, where do you want to be? Um, and really to dream about it. What is that life? Like, what are you like? Um, is it all sunshines and rainbows and butterflies when you wake up? Like, is that what you imagine? And even if it's not completely realistic to kind of lean into that and to really define why, why do I think it's going to be like this? Why do I want it to be like this? And to, we're going to dream about it all along the way, but to have a really clear picture of this is what I want and this is why I want it. And so then once we have that clear vision, we can move into step two, which is setting the goals and the resolutions that it's going to take to make that dream real. And so in some cases we have a dream, like I want to travel more. And so your goal is going to be concrete and specific to that. So in 2021, this isn't realistic for the coming year, but in 2021, like I want to travel three weeks to three different countries. Like, so that would be your specific goal because that's concrete and measurable um, you'll know if you've achieved that as opposed to just like, I want to travel more is not a very concrete resolution. It's one you're never going to be able to measure. Uh, and your brain's always going to say, well, you could have traveled more. Um, so even if you're not going to be doing much more traveling in 2021 right. than we did last year, it's that idea of breaking it down into something concrete and measurable. So once we have our goal, when we'll know if it's been accomplished, we can move into step three, which is creating the plan. Um, and so the plan for everyone is going to be completely different, even if they have the exact same goal. So this is when we can really create a plan that is specific to you, specific to the problems that you're going to face. And so I have a method that I use to walk my clients through that, creating a plan. Um, and actually, if you have already faced failure in the year, you have a very clear idea of what needs to be in your plan because you already know which hurdles are going to come up and what needs to be part of your plan, what you need to be prepared to overcome. So then once we've made our plan and worked through it in step three, then we reach stage four, which is reality. And this is when we get to celebrate because you have made those dreams reality. And some people don't reach the stage until December 31st and other people reach it at some point during the year, but it's really taking that time to celebrate and honor the success that you found and the steps that you've taken all along the way and that person that you've become. Um, and through the process, you build so much self-confidence and self-trust that 
you know, okay, when I set resolutions next year, they're as good as done because I know I can achieve the things that I set out to. Amazing. So when we think about, you know, our own goals as, as coaches, as um, people who might be working on our own financial situation or any other goal, personal goal that you have, this is really how to go about thinking, thinking about it. But I also, because this is, you know, a large amount of the listeners for the podcast are coaches themselves and they're working with individuals on their money. I think it'd be really beneficial for you to share, you know, basically how you help clients who, I don't know if there's a better way to say this, fall off the wagon, so to speak, and how you help them get back on. Um, and I think especially because uh, for finance in particular, and this is probably very similar to organizing, like there's a thing you, you need to do the upkeep. There's no actual end goal, especially when it comes to like budgeting, for instance, you have to just continually do the upkeep and you'll reach small goals along the way, but it's an, a process you just have to work to to become a habit. Um, but as money coaches, we face this, the challenge of clients just, you know, giving up, maybe becoming disinterested or, uh, you know, whatever it is that kind of knocks them off. And then it's really hard to get back onto the plan. So how do you support your clients? How can we learn from you and, and how we can best show up for our clients as money coaches? Yeah, absolutely. I have so many thoughts. So one thing I try to convince my clients of, because being on the wagon or kind of that idea is all just something that we make up. So when they, yeah. when they fall off or they think that they fell off this kind of metaphorical wagon that they put themselves on, I try to convince them that there's no such thing that falling off is just part of the process. Um, and through the process of working to reach goals, we know that there are going to be hurdles and that a lot of the times that's the reason we haven't achieved these goals in the past is because of the hurdles that we face. So facing a new one, getting bored or tired or whatever may come up that knocked you off the wagon being okay with that and recognizing that's part of the process and nothing has gone wrong, but also then realizing, okay, we don't want to stay here. Cause I've been obsessed lately with this idea that uh, if you quit in the dip, thinking that kind of the whole ride of reaching the goal is like a roller coaster. If you quit in the dip, then that's how you get stuck in a rut. Like that's how you don't keep making progress on the things that you want to. Um, and if you do it in this area, then you're going to be tempted to do it in other areas too. So not letting yourself quit here, knowing that there will be another high at some point, and there'll probably be another low after that, but that's okay. It's just part of the way that we're going and the things that we want to achieve. So when you're working with clients, though, who feel like they want to stay stuck in that rut, I really encourage people to return to that step one, the dream and the vision that they created, because that's the reason that we're on this ride in the first place is because of the place that they want to end up at the end of the ride, or even the journey that they want to be on to get there. And so helping clients to return to that, to the reason that they chose to work with you in the first place, because of the things that you said you would help them to achieve, um, the goals that they shared, and returning to their why. Why did they want this in the first place? Is it so that they can retire early? Is it so that they can travel? Is it so that they can go pursue some passion project? Is it so they can put their kids through college? Whatever their why is, that's going to be the compelling reason to get them up the next side to the next high. And ultimately that's probably what all of their highs are gonna be about is making progress towards those things that really matter to them. So helping them to return to that vision, to remind them of their why is gonna be the most compelling thing for them because there's lots of reasons like we should pursue our goals, but it's, it's gonna be for them. It's gonna to be totally specific to them, the things that they want that are gonna be the things that get them out of the rut that they find themselves in. Mm -hmm. I love that, the, the fact that falling off the wagon is part of the process instead of calling it a failure. It's like, oh no, this is exactly what was supposed to happen. Kind of acting like that in a way. Well, and I think even as coaches to have the mindset that it's so great that they fell off the wagon metaphorically while they're with you. So you can help them get out of it is so much more powerful than being like, oh no, they fell off the wagon. I don't know what to do. Because if you finish working with them and then they have this experience six months later, you don't want that because then you're not there to help them. So it's so much more powerful that you can be with them right now as they're going through this. And if you've never had someone fall off the wagon before, you get to work through it together. But it's so powerful for the client to have you still show up as the coach, still in control, just knowing that it's part of the process. And you believing it's part of the process is really the first step for them beginning to believe it. Mm -hmm. What about for, and, and this is just... Um, I guess, out of curiosity on my end, but with you being a new year's resolution coach for clients who you work with, who truly are kind of 
ready to change or pivot their re- resolution midway through? How do you how do you handle that? And I think this happens for for many different coaches who just like have clients who have shifting priorities as they go. Yeah. So I think this is, again, a perfect time. This is why we really have to set that vision and that dream at the beginning. You really only want to change your goal when your dream or your vision has changed. So Mm -hmm. I'll give a couple examples of me personally. Um, So for me, like some of my goals, my new year's resolutions have shifted over the years as my practice changed from realizing when you're starting out that I was a professional organizer, this was what I was doing to as I shift to coaching, some of my goals and my resolutions around my business kind of shifted around that, realizing, okay, this isn't going to be my focus anymore. I want to coach more. And so I created resolutions or I shifted some resolutions to be more about that side of my business. Or even um, 2020, I started the year not knowing that I was going to have an idea to write a book a few years or a few weeks into the year. And so it was mid-January last year when I said, I had an idea that came to me and I was like, I want to write this book. And so I spent a lot of time over 2020 writing that book and making that dream reality because I want to try to book a long time. But that was a resolution that I couldn't anticipate at the beginning of the year. But both of those things are kind of when my overall dream or my vision of the life I want to create shifted for some reason, a lot of it is ultimately internal to me, but it changed that vision of the life that I want to live into. And so that's when I decided to change my resolutions, not because the pandemic happened or because I got bored or tired or, oh, this new thing came along. I'd rather do that because that's new and exciting. So I think it's coming back to that ultimate reason. Is it still, is changing your goal going to support that ultimate life that you want to create? Has that ultimate life changed? Is that why you're changing the goal or are you changing it because you've been working at this for six months and you really just need to kind of persist a little bit longer. So I think that's really the key to differentiate between those two. And if you are changing because something in your life has changed or maybe something in the world, and if that's the reason, then okay, if that's you have a new compelling why, a new compelling thing to go after, then do that. You don't wanna keep pursuing something that ultimately isn't gonna get you where you wanna go. But if you know that persisting with this will take you in the direction of your dreams and you're just kind of tired or bored, then Maybe take a break, but don't give up. Keep working on that goal. Commit to pursuing it. Um, And through that persistent action, you will ultimately reach the goal, even if it takes a little longer than a year or a little longer than what you may ideally have wanted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, perfect. I think that the hardest thing about working towards goals is that it it's uncomfortable, like you had mentioned, and that's why we end up giving up. And uh, I love to think about the fact that Courage is something that you need, especially if you're building your own business um, as a coach. Courage is really what it takes to put yourself out there and show up. But like, we don't realize that courage is not comfortable. It sounds really sexy, like, oh, they were so courageous. But like, the people who are actually courageous are so uncomfortable in that moment. They're they're facing their fears. They're going. They're moving through, you know, their own concerns to get to the other side, to then be known as courageous. Yeah, I think courage and commitment is the other, those two emotions together are so powerful and they will get you through pretty much anything, get you to do pretty much anything. Um, and those motivation, those or those emotions like motivation or inspiration, uh, while those sound really sexy and they do feel really good when you're in them, that's not gonna take you where you wanna go because you're not gonna feel them every step of the way. So when you can bring courage or commitment to those hard situations and those hard, hard moments or when it's 5 30 a.m and you need to get up and work on your business but you really don't want to and your covers are warm it's that courage to keep showing up and that commitment to yourself and the business you want to create that will get you out of bed not necessarily motivation mm-hmm. yeah I think that's a big issue in in the space of you know especially for people who are building businesses to think well and, and this is kind of like a a problem with the more esoteric way that at least I've experienced seeing the the coaching industry go is this idea that like you should only create while you're in flow or while you're inspired or when you're motivated. And it's like, all of those things are fleeting. You have to activate them. Like they don't just happen upon you. And so it, it takes that courage to like get to the point of motivation. Otherwise, like, yes, motivation can come and go and then you can act on it, but you're not going to be consistent. You're not going to show up and you'll probably not reach your goals. Yeah. There's a great book called Daily Rituals. Um, I think it's by Mason Curry and he tells uh, little snippets on so many great artists and creators of probably like the last 200 years and the practices Mm -hmm. that they have 
to create. And many of them created every day, like no matter what they were feeling and whether they started work at 5 p.m. and then would work to like three in the morning or other people get up at 3 a.m. and work for a few hours. Like it's just so fascinating to hear how different people create. And so you can set systems up in your life that are going to cultivate you and your creativity and the life that you ultimately want to create to support your goals. But there are going to be mornings or evenings or whenever you like to work when you don't feel like showing up and you probably need to anyway. Uh, that's what it's going to take. And that's okay. Again, that's part of the ultimate process. Um, Mm -hmm. And even thinking ahead to the person that you want to be, the person that you want to be probably feels in flow a lot of the time, but that comes from years of practice and years of figuring that out. And even there's parts of your business that you might want to do more when you're in flow, but you're not going to have the opportunity to do that if you don't do any of your business, if you're not in the state of flow. So kind of maybe saving some writing time, or if you have a great idea for a live and feel in flow to do that, then do that then, instead of using that to send emails or to write a blog post. Like there are things that are going to be great to use motivation and energy for when you have that. And sometimes you'll have to do it anyway, even if you don't feel it, but then using some of that commitment and courage to show up even on the back end stuff that maybe no one ever sees, but that is still important is also really powerful. Mm -hmm. And I guess my last question for this is how, how do you create motivation when you like feel like when you're in a rut, when you, when you don't want to get stuck in the rut, but you're about to quit, what did you call it? Don't quit in the bottom. bottom. Yeah. In the dip or at the bottom. Yeah. You don't want to get stuck in the the rut. Um, Well, it's a great question. I think we know like as coaches, our emotions are caused by our thoughts. So whether it's for us or our clients, finding those thoughts that are ultimately going to bring us back to that motivation, or maybe it's just commitment, whatever emotion you think you need to feel to take the next step to get you up the ladder, up the other side of the dip out on a flat level ground again. Mm -hmm. Um, It's going to be totally different for all of us. But I think the thing that is so key though, is remembering not to add the additional suffering of, oh, this shouldn't be happening. Oh, I'm a coach. So I shouldn't feel this way. Oh, I've been here before. So I should never have had to experience this again. Adding that additional suffering of this shouldn't be happening, or I should know better. That is also is what makes us like sink even lower into the mud at the bottom of the dip, because then we have to climb out of that. And then whatever else we feel like put us there, whatever thought or situation that we then had a thought about that got us there. So finding whatever thoughts are compelling to you, but not letting yourself compound it by thinking you should know better because it's part of the process for all of us, even as coaches to sometimes have those down moments. And then realizing maybe, maybe the thought that gets you out of there is, Ooh, I get to experience this now and practice so that I can get out of this dip. And then I'll have a better idea of how to help my clients do it. Maybe that's a compelling reason for you. And For a lot of people, it's again, returning to your why that's going to be a compelling reason, or you're going to be able to think something about that and your desire for that and your desire to move towards that. That'll help you take those gradual steps to get up. Mm -hmm. I love that you said that, you know, just having that experience is such a compelling reason because that's something that I always tell my clients is you are your first and best client. So, you know, act like it and, and use this opportunity to practice your own, your own skills and really get better at them. And, and I think as you had mentioned, like, don't add that additional suffering, just take it at face value and, and coach yourself into the flat, the flat ground. (laughs) Yeah. And realize it probably didn't take one thought or circumstance to get you to the bottom of the rut. So it might not take one, just like one magical turn of phrase that'll suddenly you'll be on flat ground again. Like it might take a little work to get back up there. And that's okay too. Yeah, absolutely. Carly, thank you so much. We really just kept this running and got so much good value out of this uh, conversation as far as the, the, the round of, of getting into your expertise. So I'd love to go into just talking a little bit more about the money stuff. Um, first of all, I would just love to know, and I think this is something that, uh, everyone is always curious about, but they don't always ask, how do you make money? Yeah, well, in crazy times, I actually still make money from a day job that I have. So that's like kind of my steady base level income. And then I make money from organizing and coaching. So I kind of have all of those revenues coming in. And like I talked about, I wrote a book. So hopefully someday I'll have a little bit of money coming in from a book too. That's something that I'm kind of working towards. And hopefully that's a dream that I'll make reality at some point in the future. Yes. So exciting. And are you doing a lot of organizing um, virtually then? Is that how that's going right now? 
yeah, a lot of people who want just kind of that extra set of eyes and ears and direction, um, the expertise to come in through a screen and give them pointers and directions. And some people just need someone to sit with them really on Zoom while they go through and make all of the decisions necessary in decluttering. So it's fun. It's very different. But um, my team is there ready to help people who want that little bit of extra help uh, yeah. <laughs> getting, getting started. Well, it's great that you've been able to pivot in that way and, and still support people. Perfect. What is one of the best investments you made in your business? Um, I think it's probably just education on any and all levels, like from Facebook ad courses I took to getting my certification from the Life Coach School, like any investment in me, I know will reap infinite reward for myself. Um, it's, it's so fun to learn new things. I just love doing that in any way. So whether it's reading a book or kind of investing in myself in those higher levels, I just know it's going to be so worth it in the end. Um, so always kind of looking for new ways to do that while also not overburdening myself or using that learning as a way to escape doing the actual work that needs to be done. Yes, that is very important. Information does not create transformation. Yes, without it's very true. <laughs> oh, I love that. Um, if you were handed $3 million today, what would you do with it? <laughs> probably super boring. I think I would invest and save a lot of it. Um, I would probably give some to my parents to allow them to retire early, um, give to charities and organizations that I care a lot about, and then I'll take my friends and family on a big trip once, once we can all do that together <laughs> and safely again. <laughs> yes, absolutely. What is the best piece of financial advice you've been told and that you would like to pass along? This is hard. And I think it actually kind of stems from and uh, growing up in a culture that does not talk about money enough. And that's why you money coaches are so necessary to bring money into the everyday conversation. But I think the best piece of money advice is to just start. Whatever it is, whatever your next step on your money journey is, whether you need to start budgeting or you need to invest on yourself or your business or just invest money to the next level, whatever that looks like for you, you on December 31st is going to be glad that you started. You don't want to be still wishing that you had started. So just start whatever that next step is for you, whether it's starting your business or something money related. That I think is just the best first step. Yeah. You have to start best somewhere. Best piece of advice, period. Yeah. <laughs> just go. Perfect. All right. We're going to go into the quick and dirty Q&A round. These are just a couple fast paced questions to wrap up the show. And the first one I would love to know, you're probably like, I know all these questions. I'm, I'm ready for them since you've been I've listening. Them all. <laughs> <laughs> what is something completely random that you can't stop thinking about lately has nothing to do with business or money? Something that I've been obsessed with lately is reading sales emails from people and organizations. So it's like a little bit business related because I think we're always learning and growing, but I've just loved reading people's sales emails and seeing what tactics they use. And I just find it fascinating to see just kind of the language and the pictures that they paint um, and the different tactics like psychologically that they use. Um, images and gifts, even like in the body of emails. I, I just find it so fascinating, like everything from copywriting to like selling courses and programs, like everything. It's just so interesting to me. Awesome. What is something you love to do to step away from your business? I read a lot. So I think walking and reading are kind of the two things that I do to really rest and recharge. Uh, business books don't really bring that rest with them. So I kind of count that in a separate category, but anything, even personal development related that counts as fun reading. So I love to do that or to put it in my ears and go for a walk. That's what I do to yeah. get away. Amazing. Your favorite account to follow on social media. I love following, uh, Ali Kazaza. So I think her username on Instagram is like Ali underscore that's me, but I think this is kind of back from my organizer past. She's like the life minimalist is how she, uh, like her moniker for herself. And so she has programs and courses. And so it's interesting for me to watch her sell herself and her business and her life. Um, and she's just really vulnerable and honest and kind of shares every part of her journey. Um, so I just really love following her like business wise and organizing wise and even coaching wise. She just has so much valuable wisdom and insight to share, I think. So cool. I will have to check her out. Carly, this has been such a pleasure having you on the Wonder Wealthy podcast. I would love for you to share with us how we can keep in touch, how we can follow along, how we might be able to sign up to work with you, um, and anything else we need to know about you so we can virtually stalk you. 
Yeah, so I am at Carly Tizano and at CarlyTizano.com. It's C-A-R-L-Y-T-I-Z-Z-A-N-O. Um, and I always offer free kind of goal setting calls. But if we're at this point in the year and you've already faced some hurdles, I would love to get on the phone with you and talk you through them and create a plan for you going forward uh, so that you can achieve your resolutions. Or if you haven't set them yet, get on the phone and we can do that. Perfect. Thank you so much, Carly. This has been a pleasure. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. It's been so fun. And that's a wrap, episode 201 with Carly Tizano. If you want to get out the show notes to check out all of the things that Carly mentioned in this episode, she had some good book recommendations, plus all of the links to get to know and stay in touch with her, head to wanderwealthypodcast.com slash podcast slash episode 201. And you guys... We have just launched the group round of the Wealthy Coach Blueprint, and it has been such an honor and a privilege for me to be supporting these amazing, motivated and driven money coaches to build their booked out, life-changing coaching program and coaching business. And if you're interested in joining us for the next round, I invite you to reach out to me on Instagram. First of all, if you're not following me, what you've been doing, go ahead and reach out to me and just send me a message. You can literally just say blueprint and we will talk about what that could look like for you the next go around. In the meantime, honestly, just stay tuned, okay? February is a month where I am committing right here, right now to have something really good, really juicy coming your way. So stay tuned to the Wander Wealthy podcast. Stay tuned on Instagram. My handle is at Tess underscore Wix because if you have been looking for an opportunity to work with me, you're not quite sure if the blueprint is the right fit quite yet, then like I said, just stay tuned. All right. With that, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. And until next time, I hope you wander wealthy.